not sure the Millennium Dome will ever look anything other than a, like a really weird building. Like a kind of building that makes you wonder what they were thinking. It's funny to look at such a large kind of concert venue or an exhibition centre and entertainment centre and consider that it must have been dormant for the last year. I don't know if they did anything in there in September, October for that very brief window when things started to come back to life a little bit but I imagine not. We'll talk more about the Millennium Dome in a minute when we get round to the Greenwich Peninsula proper by the Thames. The real subject of today's walk, the thing that brings me here to the Greenwich Peninsula is what's staring me in the face lying ahead of me. What they're calling New London. screens my film the London Perambulator in that venue in there so really good evening I think this land here to be honest would have been bizarre at probably at any point in its history being a big peninsula that sticks out into the Thames and it would have been quite remote and isolated marshland for for much of the history of the settlement of London but they've certainly not made it any less bizarre <laughs> with what they've built here. I'm just trying to grapple with uh, how to approach it. I think maybe we might have to go out and then come back round in order to view from the perimeter. Do you think that's a good plan? I mean, you can develop all the plans you like in the world when you're sat at home, but it's when you're here, you're like, what's the best way in? So I'm actually going to go up into a little viewing platform here first and then I think we should head towards those green spaces and then loop back around the peninsula. I think that's a good way to explore this area. First I think we have to go up here because it seems to be calling us up here and it might allow us to survey the terrain. see the towers across the river there around Canary Wharf and the Isle of Dogs and it gives you a sense of the, the continuity that they're trying to create here over the river on the south side. Developers really like to talk of this area inventing itself rather than reinventing itself and they see it as being London's most boldly modern landscape which it's got quite a bit of con competition at the moment hasn't it what I thought was really interesting in their literature they list the, the number of new jobs it's something like 17,000 new homes 12,000 new jobs or the other way around but they talk of the people living here as being pioneers which is really interesting isn't it it's, kind of reinforces that kind of year zero approach that a lot of developers have to parts of London as if there was nothing here before, there was nobody here before and that it was a kind of like a terra nula, a place to be claimed by colonists which is kind of, says a lot about their thinking doesn't it, about London as a whole, I think. So I think that's the way we're going to go down through there along that new sort of park and then back around the peninsula. Mitre Passage, Peninsula Central. The uh, Emirates cable car thing over there. I wouldn't have thought they'd have been running at the moment, but obviously they are. I was actually, um, really disappointed with those that cable car ride I did it about six years ago and uh, I wasn't yeah I don't know it was uh, all a bit nothing really this is uh, I think what they're calling a design district here 
It's really interesting. That design there really reminds me of the Tesco's value products in the 90s. Anyone remember those? The, the blue and white stripes? Wow. There's a whole other chunk of the Greenwich Peninsula development over there. We've got an encounter. This is uh, East Parkside, Southeast 10. New strip of parkland here. I don't know if they've named it yet. There's nothing on my Apple map telling me the name. So for much of the history of London, this was marshland, very remote, stuck out on the Thames. And it was drained in the 17th century by Dutch engineers. I suppose have a problem with drainage, don't they? <laughs> it's interesting, actually. It was always seems to have been foreign engineers who drained parts of London. Like um, Plumstead Marshes, for example, was drained by an Italian engineer for which he was granted lands and great favours. I think that was in the Elizabethan era. So we, uh, we owe a lot to imported expertise for reclaiming land in London. We'll talk more about some of the uh, stories associated with the peninsula when we get round onto the peninsula. But when it was known as Bugsby's Marshes, that was one of the names here, it was uh, one of the trades here was in whale oil. It was the point where they would drag the whales onto the shore here at Blackwall Point on Bugsby's Marshes and it became known for the manufacture of whale oil. Yeah, Ian Sinclair was telling me about this because a friend of his, that's where this guy's family had made, uh, had made their money at some point in the past. I don't, didn't even notice the Moby Dick the first time I came through. There's, there's another, another whaling pub with a beautiful sign on it. But I mean, the, this dock, Greenland Dock, was where a lot of the whaling expeditions were, were going out from. This was a place the whale meat was brought into London. So it's re I mean, it was really significant in terms of the story I was trying to tell about the whaleburn box and the connections between Herman Melville, who was in London, and um, L. Hannon Bicknell, who was the, the whale oil magnet. So he's essentially lighting London, this beautiful soft light that, that London is, and the smell. And he's boiling the, the vats of whale bones and whale meat on um, Greenwich marshes, East Greenwich marshes, Bugsby's Marsh. And his descendant, Wrenchy Bicknell, is the painter who's coming around with me and was telling me about how they lived, the house was near Ruskin's in Hearn Hill and Turner was commissioned to paint a series of whale hunts. He'd never seen a whale, but he does these paintings. And Al Hannon took out his handkerchief and cleaned off a corner of Turner's painting and started to redo it himself because he didn't quite like, and there was an amazing row and, and Turner stormed out. So you can imagine, uh, <laughs> the smell would have been pretty gross. And it was obviously it's a horrible, horrible trade in the the slaughter of whales and the carcasses laid upon this land here. You can imagine, can't you, those enormous whale carcasses, all the whale bones here, scattered around this landscape. It's quite a vision, isn't it? You can see the next phase of development over there hasn't quite reached there yet. The towers are yet to come. They're marching their way around the peninsula. I know some of you are probably thinking, hang on a moment, what about the Greenwich Meridian, the Greenwich Observatory, the famous Greenwich, the Royal Naval College and all that? Well, that's that in that direction over there, further west. Here's a little surviving remnant of the old Greenwich. The Pilot Pub here, which was a Fuller Smith and Turner pub, fine brewery, and a row of houses. When you, when you walk around this part of South East London now, and I've walked a bit around Woolwich, as you've seen, around to Erith, and along the waterfront at Charlton, walked along there with the great Ian Sinclair, and also further on west there, where you see the Royal Naval College, and the Royal Observatory, you get a sense of the grand past of this part of London. It's not so easy to conjure it up otherwise, but this was an incredibly important part 
of, of the British kind of maritime world, the British maritime tradition, was based down here on the Thames, along this stretch of the foreshore here. Now it, the rest of the world feels quite distant in terms of a uh, seafaring sense. It's the planes coming in every 10, 15 minutes into City Airport that links us to the rest of the world. Somebody did note on my, uh, on my East Village walk, I think it was the wonderful Ridgely, that I seem to have learnt to have contained my cynicism when talking about the new developments, and that's something I've put a lot of work into, so I'm going to try and remain relatively neutral from now on. Obviously there are times where neutrality is impossible <laughs> if the development is such an affront to our sense of humanity and decency, as you'll see in my uh, answer to a question on this in my previous Q&A video. <laughs> but by and large, I see my mission here is to document. Just document, that's all I want to do. Just point the camera there, try and leave you to make up your own minds about what you see in front of the lens. Occasionally something will slip out. this video uh, just the other day by the, the by the brilliant youtuber bald and bankrupt i know i struggle with that word bald you know as in having no hair i tend to say bold bald bald but bald and bankrupt you know the guy brilliant one of the best channels on youtube by far and i watched this video where he was walking around moldova and all the kind of ruined buildings right in the center of moldova <laughs> and oddly i see a kind of this is kind of like the what they call it the analog of that there's somewhere in between the two anyway <laughs> there's obviously this sort of ruined decay, this neglect and then there's, there's this, this kind of almost like a historical year zero development wipe the surface clean, delete the past and build on top of it in this case what you're building on top of is deeply, deeply toxic ground really toxic ground not only do you have the whale oil plants here you have the, the gas and coke works Another one which claims to have been the largest in Europe, like Beckton. We'll come to that in another walk, another week. And then there was uh, armaments works here. Inevitably, if you're going to have a big explosive accident, better to have it where, <laughs> where you've got very few people living. You could, blow, you could blow up something here and maybe not do too much damage. So this is really land. <laughs> it's not like a prime site for habitation, really. Hence... We didn't really attempt mass habitation here <laughs> until recently. We had to really decontaminate the land very thoroughly to try and build the Millennium Dome there. Later on I'll talk more about what Ian Sinclair thinks of all of that when we get round the peninsula. Suffice to say, I'm sure you can imagine that Ian Sinclair's not a fan. Oh, this is kind of interesting. Makes me think of somewhere in continental Europe. Sort of Barcelona or Amsterdam. Definitely a kind of continental feel to this little plaza here with these apartment blocks with shops below. They've definitely modelled this on something in, uh, in Europe. Uh, we're in Europe, but we're like this island bobbing around in the North Sea, aren't we? What I, what I will say for the planners of this bit, it does feel quite distinct. You know, it doesn't feel like the Olympic Village or City Island. It's got a different kind of vibe and feel to it. I don't know if there's a more significant proportion of social housing down here. I'll have to look that up. But that always creates a different sort of situation because it's a place where people kind of are permanently kind of settled. People don't move from council housing. That's one of the things about it. It's one of the reasons why actually council housing ends up being quite profitable, actually. No one ever goes. The places are never empty. So this is called Greenwich Millennium Village. Greenwich really did see itself as playing a big role in the millennium, I guess. It's partly because of measuring the time from Greenwich that we called that the millennium, I guess. 
like a little ecology park here. So they call it the Southern Park Meadows, and it tells you all the things you can find here yarrow, greater knapweed, common poppy, oxide daisy, red dead nettle. There's butterflies and moths, all different varieties. Swallows, house martings, kestrels, blackbirds, wrens and swifts. It's great. This little, uh, nice little boardwalk here takes you out across the water. That would be quite nice to live there, with that nice little wraparound balcony on the water. It's quite a beautiful spot here. Uh, I know I said I wasn't really going to give opinions and stuff, but um, I've got to be honest, I did expect this to be a sort of dystopian hellhole, but it's actually quite nice. <laughs> this bit, anyway, certainly quite nice. I'll reserve judgment on the rest of it. You, you tell me what you think in the comments. If I, uh, if I had to be exiled, in any of the new London developments, I think it would be this one. Uh, you know, I'd accept this is my Siberia. There's quite a lot more of the new development over there, um, but I'm actually going to turn to go around the peninsula now, so you'll have to forgive me for missing that bit out, but I think it's just going to be more big blocks of flats, right? Looking east along Bugsby's Reach, out towards the Thames Barrier there. Looking across to the development around Silvertown there. Wow, it's, uh, it's quite different from this side of the river. When you're in it, you don't really have any perspective, do you? Of course, just across there in Silvertown, was the site of the, uh, I think it's still the largest explosion to ever have gone off in London. I might be wrong about that. That might be the IRA bomb at Bishopsgate possibly was bigger, but it was 50 tonnes of TNT exploded there in 1917, killing 69 people. I bet there's some good mud larking down there. But Cy Fines has been down there and found some treasure. I think that's recycling in those yellow containers there on the barges. I'm sure someone will correct me in the comments if that's not the case. But Greenwich Yacht Club is quite an impressive place, isn't it? I feel like we've got to go for a walk along the foreshore here. The northern tip of the peninsula where we're heading now is another one of those sites which is associated with the execution of pirates. There's been a few of them out there on the walks that we've encountered over there at Wapping, of course, was a notorious place for hanging pirates and leaving them in the water till three tides have washed over them and likewise at the point where the river Neckinger meets the Thames was another point of execution giving its name to the Neckinger, the Neck Ringer, Neckinger and so likewise was Blackwall Point it was another place where pirates met their end. Poor old pirates. It's funny isn't that how our view of the pirate has changed Recently now pirates are seen as a, kind of a jolly, playful thing to entertain children and make Disney movies about. Obviously viewed them very different in the past. <laughs> look at this. This would have been like a metal casket, look, with its studded top. I wonder what treasure was in there. It's interesting, isn't it, to think of London as a city of ships and pirates and sailors and explorers. It's a really romantic, sea-tinged 
view of London as a city, isn't it? A maritime city. London, the maritime city. And actually, it's interesting, in the city of London, there still are maritime institutions that still exist. When I studied at City of London Polytechnic, down there at Tower Hill, I showed that on my London Wall Walk. That was one of the, um, the main places to do your training to become a, a ship's captain. It was interesting, and it was, uh, I think, on the course. They used to study in the room next to me on the course. Something like 25 people on the course, and 20 of them were Greek. Do you think they built this thing here as a, an offering to the river gods to try and keep the, uh, the tower blocks and the new development at bay? That's what I believe. It did feel appropriate to come to Greenwich on the first day of British summer time, being that this is all measured from the observatory just around the peninsula here. Greenwich, the place where time begins. Lovely to, lovely to meet Andrea and Musa back there. And also I met some really lovely people yesterday on my way back from the Olympic Park. I met my three fantastic people who came up to me in the street and uh, told me they enjoyed the videos. Somebody gave some nice little bit of information about Hackney Wick as well, so thank you for that. So it's uh, always nice to meet people that watch the videos, it's lovely. This is part of a long conversation, these walks. So we're just working our way around the uh, edge of the Greenwich Peninsula now, making our way around towards the front of the Millennium Dome, the centre of the Millennium Celebrations. And what a disaster it was. Of course, the Millennium Dome was used during the London 2012 Olympics. I think it was used for gymnastics and Paralympic basketball, I believe, and various other things. Well, this has got to be one of the more unusual street names I've come across. Reminder Lane. That surely can't mean just like a reminder that you get on your phone or your computer. It's got to be something else. Please tell me that. future awaits. I kind of love this civic history that you find along on board. So we've got a great one here talking, look at that, look at the, um, a man walks underwater in 1832 in the Thames near Greenwich Hospital. For 20 minutes he walked under there, dressed in the manner to exclude water, wearing a soft helmet. Isn't that amazing? So it says 1800. Industry undergoes dramatic growth during the second half of the 1800s. Flushing toilet is introduced and cesspools are abolished. Amazing. Those were the days, eh, before that. There's some good quotes here, I like this quote. Do all Englishmen have only one arm or one leg, says the future Queen Caroline when she disembarked amongst ex-seamen at Greenwich in 1795. You can see Greenwich Reach there on the, uh, on the map. There's a reference to the explosion that I mentioned earlier on. And here, the grim history of Bugsby's Hole, where uh, executions were carried out. 1700, it tells us that Greenwich is still the favoured spot for the monarchy, and development continues with the construction of the Greenwich Hospital and the Queen's House. That's further west, though, that you can see here is the grounds of the Royal Naval College. That's not this part of Greenwich, on the peninsula here. 1675, the construction of the Greenwich Observatory. Very important location in the history of the world, really, isn't it, I guess? 1600, and the construction of a royal palace in Greenwich. Greenwich Marsh passes through a series of landowners. I love things like this, where they go, look, in 1577, uh, Francis Drake, so Francis Drake sails down the Thames from Deptford, near Greenwich, yeah, but he didn't sail from Greenwich, so really, you can't, you know, you're just linking Greenwich to something from Deptford. <laughs> it's getting very windy now, by the way. 1500, Greenwich becomes the possession of the monarchy, and royal palaces and homes are built along the banks of the river. Now we're getting into the period of time I'm more interested in. 1100, in 1081, William of Normandy, otherwise known as William the Conqueror, confirms Greenwich as the possession of the Abbey of St Peter. 
Danish Vikings coming up and causing a lot of bother in 1812 and they laid anchor at Greenwich. They kidnap Alfred, Archbishop of Canterbury, and drag him to Greenwich and eventually murder him. I wonder what was wrong with the Vikings. They were always doing things like this, weren't they? The Viking commander Thurkill, good name, is so distressed that he changes sides and offers his service to the English king Ethelred. He wasn't much of a Viking if he was distressed by a murder. I mean, they were always doing it. More bother with the Vikings in the 800s again. Now, this is really interesting. Here in the, around the year 100, a shrine is built in the woods of Greenwich, now Greenwich Park. Fragments of ivory are found here indicating that shipments of this time came up the river from as far away as Africa. That's amazing, isn't it? Here, kind of really interesting bit of information, which is quite sobering at this time. 8,000 BC, England and Europe are still connected by a land bridge. The Thames joins the Rhine and flows to the North Sea. Isn't that amazing? We become an island around 6,000 BC. Context is really important when understanding the world around you, isn't it? When you look at that, 8,000 years ago, we become separated from continental Europe by the rising sea levels that are caused by the melting of the polar ice cap. Before that, this river here flowed right into the centre of Europe. Well, it didn't really. I suppose it did. Where's the wind coming from? Traders and merchants from Africa sailing up this river and trading with the people living here. That's amazing, isn't it? And goods from Africa then going inland to spread across the country. I mean... It's not really the history that we traditionally think of, isn't it? And you can imagine, imagine being here at that time. Imagine being in London with those, those ships that were coming from far and wide. We're far more connected to the rest of the world and we have been far more connected to the rest of the world than we often think. We think of it as being a sort of relatively modern thing, but actually it's been going on for millennia, hasn't it? That's a quite incredible bit of sculpture out there. I've not seen that before. Isn't that amazing? Linking back now to recent walks, looking across there to the edge of the Royal Docks and Canning Town, the tower blocks there on the edge of Canning Town where we were not long ago. It's always great to see these connections being made. So we are back now at the Millennium Dome, the place that was at the very centre of Britain's Millennium celebrations. It was meant to be the party to, well, I was going to say to end the world, but the party to usher in the new millennium and it was a complete disaster. The whole thing ended in farce. All the celebrities and VIPs were left stranded at stations around London, unable to get here, made to queue in the rain. It's, it's funny, I've been rereading uh, Ian Sinclair's amazing book, London Orbital, which really his walk around the M25 is partly in response to the building of this here on Bugsby's Marshes. And it's easy to kind of forget what a huge story it was. We were teased with the amazing millennium experience that was going to be built in here in the Millennium Dome. Now it's just called the O2 Arena, but let's not, let's not bury that bit of history. It was a huge scheme. I think it was started under the Conservative government and the whole project to decontaminate the, the land was a Tory idea. So actually, all this kind of building that we've walked through today, that's really a legacy of the decontamination of the, old, of the land here from all the kind of uh, the coke and gas works, the munitions works and all the things that have been done here before. But the Millennium Experience was a total disaster. It was a total farce. People, <laughs> it didn't take off at all. I think it had something like half the expected number of visitors. It lost an enormous sum of money. And the government that had been touting it for ages, that was by then the new Labour government, Tony Blair and all those guys, They'd been talking it up and then they very quickly stopped talking about it. Like I say, the Millennium Eve celebration night was, was terrible. It's really wonderful to read Ian Sinclair's description of that because he went to an Indian restaurant at Waltham Abbey along the Greenwich Meridian, which runs just on the other side of the Millennium Dome here. I love uh, Jonathan Mead's comment about <laughs> the Millennium Exhibition. He called it the Museum of Toxic Waste. <laughs> Thank you. 
confluence of the River Lee and the Thames just across there at Trinity Boy Wharf, where we were, what, two months ago or so? Three months ago? What have we got down there? Is that a heron? I think it is, isn't it? I think there's another one here. Are you a seabird? No, I think, look, I think these are herons. Herons? Yeah, I think so. Oh, he is as well. Yeah. See, these towers now are stretching all along the Thames. I mean, where do you want to start? They certainly started barking and they go at least as far as Battersea and I'm sure they'll be going beyond. What on earth is this here? It looks like it's been cut out of a ship. Maybe not, maybe it's designed to be this way. Look, it's sunk into the mud down there. Anybody know? Just tell me in the comments below. Well, our, our loop around the Greenwich Peninsula has brought us back to the beginning. And I think the scene of the grand fiasco of the Millennium Exhibition is the perfect place to end today's walk here in what the developers quite boldly call New London. I like to think they might have got the name from a video I made in 2016 where I walked actually just across the river there and the title that video was Welcome to New London, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure that's something I want to <laughs> have on my record but anyway that's the end of this week's walk. Thank you so much for coming with me on the first day of summer. <laughs> it's pretty chilly right? So uh, as always I look forward to seeing you lot on the next walk, wherever that may be. Wherever it'll be, it'll be amazing. It might be, um, might be slightly further afield from now on, I'm not sure yet.